try to make all of these guesses as accurate as possible. And as long as that's happening, uh, the system should be learning. And so to show how that plays out for recurrent neural networks, if you do truncated backpropagation through time, basically you get your long sequence like this, and in, you know, in this image it's been split into chunks of three, where we're saying, okay, after those three, we're not gonna do any, any more backprop. We're gonna cut the chain, do our backprop through time, and then carry on. Which obviously means any information that straddles these little chunks of three is gonna be lost as far as the gradient is concerned. And you can replace that with synthetic gradients by saying, okay, well, we will compute real gradients, but only over chunks of three, and then we're going to we're going to predict the future gradient instead of instead of using the real one. <clears throat> and of course, you can you can choose where to make these breaks anywhere you want. Essentially, you can go in, take your truncated backprop system, and just replace the truncation points with predictions. And so, what the RNN is doing is returning to predict, learning to predict the gradients that will be returned by its future self. And you know, of course, uh, with this sort of system, you 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 have to try you know you have to try it out empirically because, as I said, there's no guarantees that you're you're actually going to be following the true gradient here. So, on the face of it, you you, you might well you have to check whether or not you're actually going to learn anything. And you know, Max did a whole bunch of experiments, and he found that learning was you know it it learns uh, basically learning is just much more efficient than it is with with truncated backprop. You know, the learning that it does with, um, with, with synthetic gradients is equivalent to what you get from, from doing backprop over the whole sequence with no truncation, except, of course, it's much more efficient because now you can break the, 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 the sequence up into much smaller pieces and you can do many more weight updates. And so he tried it, for example, he did this repeat copy task from the NTM paper. He looked at pen tree bank you know, language modeling task. Basically, everywhere he's looked, he's found the same thing, which is that you, you can just get more efficient learning by having relatively small chunks. So, I mean, this is, this is the thing. The, the, with truncated backprop, as you make the, the truncation length bigger and bigger, performance really gets better. So there's a, there's a clear trade-off. But of course, learning time gets longer. With um, the synthetic gradients, typically, it, the chunks don't need to be that big. After sort of five or six time steps or something like that, the performance already sort of uh, you know, gets as good as it's gonna get. Okay. And so the final extension uh, I want to talk about is um, around the issue of guided learning. <clears throat> and so the basic you know, problem here is that recurrent neural networks, like other neural networks and other machine learning models, we're, we're still training them with kind of randomly sampled sequences. So we're still kind of stuck in this statistical mindset of let's take all the data put it in, you know, say that it's all been generated IID from some, <clears throat> uh, some underlying source put it all in one big training set and just pick randomly from that training set and keep on feeding it to the uh, feeding to the system to train. Now as long as the data is reasonably homogeneous, so things like automatic speech recognition, language modeling, uh, and you know as long as you can split it up into these more or less IAD chunks, this works pretty well. I mean, this is the basis of you know all of the results we see in supervised learning. <clears throat> and I think it works well because the network can learn just about as well from any sequence that you give it. Right? It's not so important which sequence it sees next because they're all kind of similar, right? They're all they're all drawn from the same distribution. But if you have a if you have a setup where the network or the, the learner really needs to master some parts of the training set before it moves on to others, then this becomes very inefficient. So, for example, if you have a curriculum of tasks with, of progressively increasing difficulty. Typically, you want to solve the easier ones before you move on to more difficult ones. Or if you have a whole bunch of related tasks that you, you want to transfer between, or if you have something like subtasks, like you often get in, if you're doing program induction, you want to learn some kind of subprogram, and then you want to compose subprograms into a bigger one. Obviously, you want to do the subprograms first. And so the overall solution here is that we want something that automatically guides the network towards data or tasks where learning is most efficient. So efficient means basically where it's learning as fast as possible. And so you know this plays out in you know curriculum learning, which is the setting that we analyzed in uh, in our paper that, that what I'm going to discuss here, where basically you have a decision about you know uh, which tasks should I look at next or which level of difficulty. But the same, the same kind of need for guidance, you know, this is a more general principle than that, and also happens in active learning where you're really saying, okay, 
give me the next data point to so as to optimize some sort of learning efficiency. Often also with a notion of some data points are more expensive to retrieve or to label than others. And I think the most general setting for guided learning is exploration and reinforcement learning. So you're choosing actions. You're not just uh, attempting to optimize some extrinsic reward. You're also attempting to um, uh, to explore the, the, the data, which usually means to optimize some sort of intrinsic reward to, to, to satisfy your curiosity. Um, and I mean, these things have been considered in many papers. This one at the bottom here by Mark Belmar uh, and, and others uh, about camp place exploration and intrinsic motivation, that was kind of the, the, the jumping off point for, for this, this work. So um, in curriculum learning in general, which is what I'm, what I'm going to focus on here, you've got three main challenges. So the first one obviously is just to decide what are the tasks or, or, or difficulty levels that go in the curriculum. You have to partition the data in some way such that you've got a whole bunch of different uh, jobs, different lessons to learn. And even once you've done that, you have to put these lessons in order, which isn't always as easy as it sounds. So for example, you might have multiple dimensions of difficulty that you can, you can uh, you have to consider. So it's not so easy to flatten that into a linear sequence. Or if you're looking at a system where it's not exactly a curriculum, but it's a bunch of related tasks, again, it's not so clear what order they should be in. And then the, you know, the third challenge is, well, even if you've got the order, you have to decide on this criteria. When do you progress through them? And this is also difficult. Um, for example, you know, if you make the criteria too stringent, the system might just get stuck and not progress. Uh, if you never go back to old tasks, then there's a tendency to forget them, right? And that's typically not what you want. By the end, you want to have learned everything in the curriculum. So our solution to these problems, we didn't really, we didn't look at the first problem, you know, choosing the tasks in the first place, but we tried to automate two and three by treating task selection as a multi-armed bandit problem, where the bandit is trying to optimize the learning progress of the network, and we do, you know, have various means of defining learning progress. And so this is at, in a paper that just came out recently called Automated Curriculum Learning for Neural Networks. And the premise here, uh, this whole notion of learning progress, which has been kind of pioneered by Pierre-Yves Houdet and others, is that the best lesson is the one you learn, learn the most from, in, in essence. And you can think of this almost like, what we're doing is almost like a Montessori method for neural networks. So rather than having a sort of top-down decision about what the curriculum should be and how, what order they should do it in and when they're finished at uh, each stage, we're just saying, okay, do whatever you want, but make sure you do the thing that you find most kind of interesting at the moment. And our overall system looks something like this. So we have the student, the brain here, which is just the neural network. Uh, apologies to the neuroscientists in the room. Um, and like usual, that receives data, computes gradients, and modifies weights. It also emits this signal, or rather a signal is calculated from it, which says, what was the learning progress on the last piece of uh, you know, data that you gave it? And then the teacher has a bunch of tasks to choose from. So this is the curriculum, this D1 to DK. Uh, basically, all the teacher is is a policy. So it's a set of weights, a set of K weights that determine a, a stochastic policy. And it samples from that policy at each step picks a task, then once it's picked a task, it gets a random sample from that task, and then it feeds that to the network. And so the, 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 the key thing here is how do you define progress? Well, and, and lots of people have considered lots of different you know, methods in the past. <clears throat> we looked at two main approaches. So one of them was based on prediction gain, which comes from Mark's, Mark Belmar's paper that I just mentioned, which essentially boils down to how much uh, did you decrease the, your, your error rate, your loss, when you received a particular data sequence? And in the simplest form, you just literally take a sequence, compute the loss on that sequence, perform a weight update, and then compute the loss again afterwards. So what was the change in loss on that exact piece of data? So it's a very simple measure. The other kind of more, a uh, little bit more unusual measure we used was, we called it complexity gain where you're actually, instead of measuring the, 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 the effect on the data, you're, you're measuring the increase in model complexity. So to explain what I mean by that, if, if, you're, if you're training your network with variational inference, for example, or some other kind of minimum description length like uh, 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 system, then you can actually count the number, you have a, you're, you're explicitly minimizing an upper bound on the number of bits in the, that are encoded in the network weights, so the description length of the network weights. And then you can use that and, and, and look at it and say, well, 
what happens, when does that complexity increase? When does the network add more bits to its description length? And my kind of belief, the intuition here is that the points when it adds the most complexity to its weights are the points when it's learning the fastest. So this, this idea that increased complexity of the model correlates with rapid learning progress. And you, you, know, you can measure this exactly if you're, if you're training with something like variational inference. Okay, so I'm kind of running out of time. I'll just go through some of the tasks we looked at with this system. So one of them is back to this repeat copy task I mentioned earlier. It's a very simple task. You give a random <coughs> binary sequence in, and that uh, accompanied by a number, an integer, and you say, okay, repeat that binary sequence, which means produce it as output in the same order that you received it as input, uh, n times, where n was the integer you received. So in this case, it receives a length three um, input sequence, and it has to repeat it four times. And so we designed this um, curriculum where there are two dimensions of difficulty. One is the number of repeats, and one is the length of the input sequence. Um, you know, that blue square corresponds to the example on the right. The, the, the bottom right, so the, you know, the top left of this curriculum is the easiest one. You have a length one sequence, you have to repeat it once, it's very trivial. The bottom right is the hardest one, you had to repeat a length 13 random sequence 13 times. So it's like a 13 by 13 block. And this is an example of something where you've got two dimensions of difficulty. So even just choosing, if you have to put it into a linear curriculum, it's not so clear what the order should be. And it's also an example where the curriculum is excessively long. There would be 169 separate lessons, and you don't really want your network to have to go through all 169 lessons and establish that it has you know, progressed beyond them, that it can go on to the next one. Rather, what you hope for is that it can skip through this curriculum quickly because you know, these tasks are obviously very similar, and it should be able to generalize a certain distance through them. Okay, so the overall results, um, so we looked at these two different settings, one of them is with variational inference, one of them is with maximum likelihood. Our main baseline was just to compare with uniformly sampling the task, and this turned out to be a surprisingly difficult baseline to, to beat. It's actually, it's more efficient than you might think, just the randomly picked task from a curriculum. Um, on the left, though, we can see that this prediction gain measure that I mentioned is significantly but not massively better than uniform sampling. On the right, there's a much clearer benefit, and this is where the complexity gain is G, V, C, G is basically gradient variational complexity gain, where we measure the, the, the increase in complexity of the network, and that really is a lot faster than just uniform sampling. It's a lot more efficient. So then it, it's kind of instructive to look at what is the, the syllabus, as we call it, that was learned by the G, V, the, the complexity gain network. Now, I have a video here which might or might not play. Let's see. Okay, we'll try it. If it doesn't work, I have some, some stills, essentially, so I can kind of get the same idea. Okay, you know what, I'll just do it with a figure, it's fine. It's fine, I think I, I can explain it from here. Just hit, hit present. Hit present up at the top there, you see up at the top? Okay, um, so these heat maps, what they show is during, as this thing trains, uh, the heat, the row of heat maps at the top shows the policy of the network. So what, uh, so sorry, each of these squares corresponds to this 13 by 13 curriculum with repeats on the y-axis and sequence length on the x-axis. And uh, the heat maps show, the top heat maps show, well, what's the policy, which task in the curriculum was it focused on, and the bottom one shows what's the loss, right? How good was it at solving all of these problems? And, it's, it follows an interesting pattern where at the, the start it takes very short sequences, actually length one sequences, but with variable numbers of repeats, uh, the policy that is, and it basically focuses on getting this idea of repeating a short sequence a lot of times, and it, it increases the number of repeats until it's got all of them, it's gone to 13, and then it starts to look at slightly longer sequences in the second box along, and then it starts to do complicated things where it looks at both long sequences with short repeats and short sequences with long repeats, it tends to stick, stick kind of to the edges of this curriculum. Um, and it kind of goes on like that until it's learned, you know, both to do very long sequences and lots of repeats, and then at that point it has essentially completed the curriculum. So it's nice, it kind of decomposes these two 
dimensions of difficulty such that once it's learned how to do long sequences and it's learned how to do lots of repeats, it can basically put them together. And it doesn't have to exhaustively go through all of the tasks. And I think that's the reason that it, it learns this problem more quickly. Okay, so get on to the last. Oh yeah, and while it was learning, we could actually measure the network complexity for the variational inference network, and we could see that indeed, this variational complexity gain does what it should do, which is it more rapidly increases the complexity than uh, the, the, the uniform sampling. So basically, increased complexity does indeed correspond with rapid learning, with rapid progress through the curriculum. I think the batteries are running up. Oh, here we go. Okay, so another thing we looked at were, um, this is just the, the last, uh, last experiment I'll talk about. We took these uh, baby, uh, this set of, of synthetic question answering tasks produced by Facebook, which consists of 20 different types of tasks. In each task, you have a story, or like an automatically generated story with an automatically generated question. And so the simplest thing is, you know, the story is along the lines of Mary went to the hallway, John went to the kitchen, question where is Mary, answer hallway. So the John part is just a distractor. Uh, and the stories get you know more complicated than that, uh, and they involve the idea was to set up a kind of unit test for basic intelligence for for uh, machine learning systems, so, so that if they can't solve all of these twenty tasks, there's clearly something uh, missing from them because they're they're around basic things, basic forms of inference, things like counting uh, and, and things like that. Um, the original tasks, the idea was that there's quite a limited number of stories for each. Um, for each of the tasks, uh, which was because they wanted, to, you know, they wanted to test the ability of the network to learn these things quickly and to generalize quickly, which I think is very interesting. But just to remove the issue of overfitting here, we generated a lot more. We generated a million stories for each task, um, and we just then took all of the twenty tasks and put them in a big curriculum. So this is now a, a multi-task learning setting. There isn't an obvious predefined ordering for the network. Okay, so I'm pretty much out of time, but I'll just go through quickly and say, well. In this case, the situation is kind of reversed. Variational inference training didn't work so well in general. Complexity gain was slightly better than uniform, at least in early stages, but it didn't seem to hold on to that. But prediction gain was a lot better than uniform sampling. So there's a definite win there. Um, and if we look at you know, the, the progress of the network, um, you know, this is the error rates for the uniform policy for the 20 different tasks. Uh, you can see it gets some of them quite quickly, and then others it just kind of seems to get stuck. <coughs> Um, but if we compare that with the, you know, with the error rates you get from prediction gain, it looks quite different. So first of all, it solves the, the tasks that are solved quickly with uniform sampling are solved even more quickly with um, prediction gain. So you kind of see these tasks there at the bottom left. And then some of the tasks, for example, this uh, uh, lilac kind of colored one you see in the middle, which is pathfinding, I believe is solved by the prediction gain network after you know a few quite a few examples a few million i think here uh, and and you know just isn't solved at all by um, uniform sampling and if you look at the policy learned by the, the prediction gain network it <laughs> it works better with my right hand <laughs> Uh, you can see that it, it, the reason it does this is that it focuses heavily on that task. So this purple kind of spike here, it shows the network focusing on that task until it completes it. And what's really important here is that um, because it's just looking at uh, sort of this learning progress, it is interested in tasks where uh, it is interested in tasks as long as they remain difficult, basically. So it focuses on this task until the error starts to go down. And then once the error starts to go down, the learning progress also starts to go down, which is exactly the behavior you want. You basically focus on something hard until you get it, and then you move on to something else, and that's what this does. And it also roughly puts the task, in as much as there is an order in these tasks, it tends to follow that order. So for example, there's single supporting fact, two supporting facts, three supporting facts. Clearly there's a linear increase in difficulty going on here, and uh, you can't really see it. If you look closely at the bottom left corner of this figure, you can kind of tell. It does indeed focus on those tasks more or less sequentially. So it solves the, you know, the first one, then the second one, then the third one. So um, it is, you know, at least so far, we feel that it is doing a lot of the things that we would hope from a system that is, is you know, doing this kind of automatically guided learning. And it's doing it in a very, um, 
agnostic way. So we're not even giving it in for, we're not giving the, 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 the bandit that's doing the, the, you know, the, the teacher part of the system doesn't even know what the loss of the network is. Rather, it's just receiving the signal that says how rapidly the network is learning, which makes it a very general system. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was a really exciting one. There are a few experts, so I start with the recurrent network experts. Very interesting.